Great. So, uh, well, hello, everybody. Good evening, good morning, whatever your time zone is. Uh, so thanks to the organizers for having our paper in this series. I'm a, I'm a big fan for this of the series. So also thanks for keeping it up uh, uh, in such a, with such high quality. Uh, so uh, the paper I'm presenting today is joint work with Isaac Ben David, Bia Kim, and Rabbi Musawi. Uh, so what we do in this paper is uh, an empirical study of the strategies that are pursued in the ETF industry, competitive strategies. And more, more broadly, it can be characterized as a study of the dynamics of financial innovation. So before I go into the details, let me give you uh, the motivation for, for our work. Uh, so as, as we all know, uh, exchange traded funds are pooled investment vehicles that possibly replicate an index and continuously trade uh, on an exchange similarly to company stock. Uh, so ETFs have grown tremendously in the last decades to the point that uh, uh, recently in the US, they they passed the $5 trillion mark and globally they are reaching 8 trillion of assets under management. Uh, they represent 17% of the total assets in US investment companies starting from about zero in the early 90s. Uh, uh, commentators observing these developments have talked about the passive revolution. Also, uh, these uh, uh, developments have been interpreted within the framework of the efficient market hypothesis. So the idea is that ETFs give a way uh, to, to investors to hold well-diversified portfolio and hold them for the long run, consistent with the uh, EMH. However, it appears that uh, the efficient market hypothesis doesn't give, uh, doesn't provide a full account for what is going on in the ETF industries. There are over 3,000 different products in the US, of which uh, more than 1,000 in the equity space only. So it seems that there are more than enough products to just uh, provide uh, uh, the diversification through uh, a market portfolio. Actually, some of these products track very niche segments of the market, so they are very distant from a, from a well-diversified portfolio. Just to give you a few examples, these are some ETFs that are being recently launched. They track uh, very popular themes like uh, a trade war, the legalization of marijuana, vegan food, and clean energy. And in 2020, there have been ETFs that, that, that have been launched that track the vaccine industry and the work-from-home industry. So more broadly, uh, studying uh, the ETF industry allows us to, to study the dynamics of financial innovations. In what sense? Well, ETFs are at the forefront of a new trend that's been called the democratization of finance. So as, as we all know, nowadays investors have access uh, uh, to uh, low cost or zero cost brokerage accounts and ETFs are the product of, of choice to access uh, financial markets at a very low cost. In this setting, in investors are, have access to uh, a large abundance of information uh, through formal sources such as commercial data providers, but also informal sources such as social media. So ETF providers that want to compete for market shares, they need to attract investor attention. And in doing that, they cannot rely on the usual strategies that uh, providers of, of financial products have used in the past. For example, active mutual funds can promise uh, abnormal performance or abnormal skill uh, relying on asymmetric information. So investors don't know, do not know how skilled is the fund manager. So this information asymmetry is something that providers could, can rely on or uh, as in the case of uh, structural products, uh, providers can rely on obf obfuscation and shrouding of risk. So they can tout high headline returns and, and hide the risk of these products. Well, all of this is not possible for ETFs because ETFs are passive, unlike active mutual funds, and are transparent, unlike structural products. So really, uh, studying ETFs allows us to study the competitive strategies uh, of financial innovators in a setting where products are very simple and transparent. So we look at, in a sense, a, a financial innovation in its purest form. So uh, to gain intuition of how, on how uh, ETF providers have uh, proceeded over time, 
we can take a bird's eye view uh, at the ETF industry. So in this chart, we represent the fees that ETF, ETF providers charge for different breeds of uh, ETF uh, uh, of ETFs. So we, we, we have the uh, broad index ETFs, and the first one was the S&P 500, uh, the spider on the S&P 500 that was launched in 1993. Then we have uh, uh, smart beta ETFs that started around the 2000. And then we have sector ETFs. And finally, thematic ETFs, which are the, the, the relatively, relatively newcomers to the, to the industry. Thematic ETFs are uh, products that uh, follow uh, securities that are related by a theme like clean energy but they can span multiple sectors. So what we observe here is that uh, um, over time, there was uh, compressions of fees. So there was a compression of the margins that the providers were earning on these products. So their reaction was to launch new products. And by the way, the colors in this figure represent the degree of specialization, of differentiation of these products. And this is measured as uh, the distance of the portfolio of the ETF relative to a market portfolio of all the ETFs that are present in the market, that are present in the industry. So going from blue to orange, we have products that have increasing uh, specialization, increasing differentiation. So you see that as competition became more intense, uh, providers started new breeds of ETFs that were more specialized but at the same time, this gave them some sort of monopoly power because they, which allowed them to charge higher fees. Uh, in particular, in, uh, in, the, in the case of thematic ETFs, you see they really cover niche segments of the market in which the competition is completely restricted because they have a monopoly. And so this allows to, to charge the highest fees. So this type of developments uh, suggest a conjecture. Uh, to interpret uh, you know, a theoretical framework to interpret the developments in the industry. So we, we refer to a model of product market competition in which consumers have limited attention, specifically to the model by Bordalo, Gennaioli, and Schleifer, 2016. In these models, consumers that have limited attention give disproportional weight to salient features. So fe features that make a product unique. On the other hand, they neglect the non-salient features. And so what are the two features that are present in the model? These are price and quality. Well, the price doesn't deserve explanation. The quality is any product characteristics that consumers find appealing. Consequently, in the model, there can be two equilibria. Uh, a price salient equilibria in which uh, uh, suppliers compete on price so here the, the goods are commoditized, so are low, very low differentiation. And so the examples are the fast food restaurants, economy airline seats, and most notably Walmart. Or you can have a quality salient equilibrium with highly differentiated products in which investors neglect the price. And so these products can be, can be sold at a high cost, at a high price. And examples are the fashion industry, uh, uh, business class airline seats, and most notably Starbucks. So we conjecture that this kind of uh, model in which uh, providers compete for attention can, be, can provide a fitting framework for uh, the ETF market. Consequently, we conjecture that there are two types of equilibrium in the market, a price uh, uh, salient equilibrium that corresponds to the broad-based ETFs, here you have products with low differentiation, they charge low fees, and they are targeting investors that are cost conscious, investors that care about the price of the product that they, that they pay. And then you have a, a second equilibrium, a, uh, a quality salient equilibrium, in which investors care about the quality of the product. And what is the quality as far as uh, ETFs are concerned? Well, quality can have many uh, faces, can be the expected return that is promised by the product. And I put expected in quotes here because the expectations don't have necessarily to be rational expectations. 
could be extrapolative expectations or diagnostic expectations as we are gonna show in the paper. It can be non-standard preferences, for example, a preference for gambling, or it can be investor value. So a utility function that uh, gives way to uh, values such as uh, uh, sustainability, so ESG values, or uh, religious values. And indeed you have uh, ETFs that uh, invest according to religious values. So in this segment of the market, you expect to find products that are more differentiated. So that emphasize these unique features, that these salient features, they charge high fees. And these products are targeted to investors with no standard preferences or expectations. So in the, in the paper, we contrast this conjecture to a more traditional view of financial innovation as progress towards market completion. Let's be clear, ETFs are redundant security in the sense that they can be replicated using the uh, underlying, uh, underlying assets. So the portfolio of ETFs can be fully replicated in this sense ETFs are not redundant. However, uh, ETFs lower transaction costs. In this sense, many investors that were previously precluded uh, some investment strategies, some trading strategies, now have access to trading strategies that were not previously possible, trading strategies or asset classes, uh, thanks to the reduction in transaction costs. So in this sense, uh, for, these, for these investors, ETFs are progress towards market completion. The two frameworks, the two conjectures, are uh, have a converge in interpreting uh, the segment of broad-based ETFs. Uh, in in broad-based ETFs, compete on price, so that's com consistent with the with the Bordalo and Tal et al. model. But they also allow uh, diversification uh, and um, through a broad-based products through through broad-based portfolios. Therefore, this is also consistent with the market completion hypothesis. Where the two theories uh, diverge is in the interpretation of specialized ETFs, because on the one hand. The market completion hypothesis uh, would argue that specialized ETFs provide hedging for some sort of uh, risk, for some uh, risk factor to which investors are exposed. On the other hand, the competition for attention story argues that these uh, specialized ETFs cater to some uh, uh, sentiment prone investors. So investors that are uh, overall irrational. That's where, so on the, on the specialized products, that's where we will tease out the two theories. Uh, so let me summarize the main results uh, and then uh, um, I, can take, uh, I can take some questions, if any. Okay, so the, the first uh, uh, main result is that indeed we find evidence that is consistent with uh, two equilibrium in the, in the ETF market. We have a, an equilibrium that is a price salient equilibrium in which you have broad-based broad ETFs that charge low fees, they have low product differentiation, and investors have high sensitivity to the price of the product. And then you have an equilibrium that is uh, more quality salient in which you have specialized ETFs that charge high fees, have high differentiation of their portfolios, and in which you have investors that chase past performance consistent with uh, non-standard uh, preferences and uh, non-standard uh, uh, expectations in particular. And then the second result that we are gonna show is that specialized ETFs underperform. Uh, here is a, a figure to which I will come back, but this is the underperformance five years after launch. So it's about 6% uh, in, uh, in uh, four factor alpha per year relative to uh, specialized ETFs, which instead uh, uh, seem to, to give uh, basically zero uh, outperformance. And uh, uh, we don't find hedging motive behind these uh, negative alphas. Instead, we find, we, we find that uh, these uh, specialized ETFs contain attention grabbing stocks, which are relatively overvalued. And this overvaluation subsequently leads to underperformance. Finally, we focus on the clientele, and uh, we find that uh, specialized ETFs are the preferred habitat of uh, retail investors, which are typically less sophisticated, and sentiment-prone investors, specifically uh, the Robinhood users. Okay, uh, so 
you know, let me go quickly to the, to the literature and then I can take some questions. Uh, so we relate to a literature on financial innovation. As I said, there, there's two views of financial innovation is market completion or uh, financial innovation as a tool to uh, predate on non-standard uh, preferences, uh, uh, investor preferences. And that's the, the, the literature to which, uh, uh, you know, to which the Bordalange and Ayolish Leifer model uh, uh, belongs. And then there is a, a consistent empirical evidence with this uh, predatory behavior of providers of financial innovation, going back to the paper on closed-end uh, funds of Leach, Leifer, and Taylor, and more recent evidence uh, on structural products by uh, Celerier, Vallée, and uh, Vocata. Uh, there's also an interpretation of financial innovation as providing tools for two type of behavior. On the one hand, risk sharing, which is the traditional view, but also speculation. This is a, a, a theory proposed by Simsek, and our, uh, the evidence in our paper is consistent also with this view. And then we speak to uh, all, uh, all the literature that uh, uh, studies non-standard expectations and preferences in that uh, uh, the investors uh, in specialized ETFs have uh, traits of extrapolative uh, expectations and diagnostic expectations and also preference for gambling. Okay, let me uh, stop here to see whether uh, there are questions. Yes, we have some questions, Francesco. The first one is, do you think the special design of ETFs such as authorized participants contributes to this competition for attention? Yeah, um, I, I, I actually, honestly, I haven't thought about that. Uh, I mean, I would like to, uh, whether the person asking the question could elaborate on that, but this uh, yeah. doesn't strike me uh, directly as something. Yeah. yeah. I was more thinking from the perspective uh, of uh, comparing ETF and index mutual fund. When you think about that, uh, like we view the competition in index mutual funds more from the perspective of tracking error and management fee. So I was just wondering whether there's something special about ETFs that drives this computation for attention. Right. Um, yeah, I think uh, um, what is special about ETFs is the fact that they can, you know, can be traded continuously intraday. And indeed, uh, that is a very appealing to investors that you know have this type of preferences for chasing, uh, you know, popular themes uh, on a, uh, chase, chasing trends or uh, having a preference for gambling. So the opportunity to trade at high frequency—that's what is really appealing in uh, ETFs rather than uh, uh, index funds. Okay, thank, okay, you. thank you. Uh, so another question is, are lower transaction costs because of economies of scale and scope? Uh, again, if the person can elaborate. Okay, let's move to the next question then. Uh, then e ESG is considered specialized, right? Isn't there a significant demand from institutional investors? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. So. Um, um, so if you if we go back to the, the first figure I showed to you, ESG doesn't appear as a, as a, as a standalone uh, uh, category. Uh, you see, we didn't put it here because indeed, actually, ESG cuts across different uh, uh, different um, type of uh, uh, breeds of ETFs. So you have ESG products that are really uh, broadly diversif diversified, so they impose a filter on broad indexes. And then instead you have uh, uh, ESG products that are more thematic, like the clean energy ETF that I showed to, be, to you earlier. That's why you cannot really uh, you know, talk about ESG as specifically thematic, because you also have ESG that are uh, tracking like the S&P 500. Um, yeah. Okay, so another question, Francesco, is when you say that specialized ETFs cater to return chasing investors, does it imply that broad-based investors are not chasing returns? Yeah, we have results on that. I will show you something about that. Yeah, uh, the answer is uh, there's more chasing in, spe in specialized than uh, in broad-based. Broad-based is almost zero. And the following to that question is, does that suggest that the ETF sector is less of a systemic risk concern? Uh, you know, again, I don't see the relationship between the two questions. Please elaborate. Okay, let's move then. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you for the questions. And perhaps, uh, you know, you'll find some answers in, um, 
in what follows. Uh, okay, so uh, quickly about the data. Uh, so uh, our sample covers the 1993-2019 period. In 93, you had the first uh, ETF, which was the Spider on S&P 500. And then for many years, it was the only ETF in the market. So in our broad-based, uh, in broad sample tests, uh, you know, large sample tests, we will start from the year 2000. And actually, recently, we um, have gained access to 2020 data and uh, I'll be able to show some results where basically our main findings are uh, robust also when we include 2020. Uh, so we focus on equity-based ETFs that are trading in the US market. We exclude, therefore, non-equity ETFs. Uh, ETFs that have the portfolio entirely in foreign equity, but uh, to the extent that there is some US uh, stocks and also foreign stocks, those are in our sample. Uh, we exclude inverse and leverage ETFs, and we exclude active ETFs. So um, very recently, there's been a lot of attention to these ARC ETFs that have been doing uh, great in 2020 and uh, in recent months. Uh, these are active ETFs, th therefore they are not in our main sample. But again, we have results in which, including even active ETFs among the specialized ETFs, the, uh, the, these uh, are still underperforming. And the reason is that these Activity ETFs are still about no more than 3% of the AUMs in the sector, so they don't really affect the results. Then for holdings, we use the standard data sets. For ownership, we look at uh, 13F and Robin Track data. And then for firm level data, again, standard data sets. When we look at news, we use Revenpack Analytics, which also give us a, a sentiment score for the, for the news uh, 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 regarding a stock. For the classification of ETFs. Uh, so um, uh, going back to the categories that you saw in the first figures I showed to you. So thematic ETFs, we classify them using Bloomberg and sector ETFs using CRISP. Together, they uh, represent the specialized ETFs. So these are following indexes that are narrow indexes and they are therefore highly uh, differentiated products. And then you have the smart beta ETFs, which we identify using Morningstar, and the broad index ETFs. So the difference is smart beta still follow uh, uh, large indexes, so uh, broad indexes, but they have non-standard weighting, whereas uh, the broad index ETFs have market capitalization index. Together, these are the broad-based ETFs. In terms of numbers, uh, the sample is... Uh, almost equally split between broad-based ETFs and specialized ETFs, not in terms of AUMs, as I will show you in a, in a minute. Some summary statistics. Um, uh, so you see that in terms of portfolio holdings, let's look at the median, uh, broad-based ETFs have significantly bigger portfolios than uh, the specialized ETFs, and they charge significantly lower fees than specialized ETFs. Uh, in terms of turnover, uh, they specialized at higher, significantly higher turnover. And this is again, consistent with what I was telling you earlier, the specialized allow investors really this uh, uh, trend chasing strategies, high turnover strategies. Then we look at uh, uh, short interest there's more significantly more short interest in specialized than uh, uh, broad-based. And this is consistent with the overvaluation of specialized. The abnormal return is significantly more negative for specialized relative to uh, broad-based. And this is uh, the underperformance that I showed to you. And finally, there is more delisting of uh, specialized relative to broad-based. In terms of AUM, the average size of the uh, the average size of the uh, special uh, the broad base is significantly larger, but if you look at the entire distribution, really the difference is at the right tail um, in terms of AUM and implied revenue, uh, where, which you compute has assets under management times fees. The implied revenue for a broad base is higher than for specialized, and and I have more information on that. Okay, here's uh, the evolution of AUMs. In blue, you have the broad base, you see they grow exponentially, whereas the specialized, they grow more linearly. At the end of the sample, uh, the broad base managed about 82% of all the assets in the industry. 
In terms of revenues, however, the two breeds, the two breeds of ETF are, are closer. Uh, so the, the distance is not uh, uh, as large as for AUMs. And that's because, uh, as I showed to you, the, the average fees of specialized are higher than the average fees of uh, broad base. So that in terms of gener generated revenues, the two categories are closer. Okay, these are launches over time. Uh, you see there are some clusters like in 2006, uh, clusters of launches are specialized, but there are also clusters of closures soon after. So the, the closures of specialized are in general higher than the closures of uh, uh, broad based. Okay, so uh, let's move to the, to the first part of the analysis in which we uh, search for segmentation in, in the market. So we, we provide evidence of segmentation in the market of these two equilibria I was telling you about. And so here we, you have two snapshots in 2002 and uh, at, the, you know, at the beginning of the industry, let's say, and 2019, which is the uh, end of our sample. Here we, we uh, depict all the ETFs by their fees and by their degree of differentiation. The differentiation is one minus cosine similarity of the ETF portfolio relative to a portfolio of all ETFs that exists in the market at that point in time. Cosine similarity is like a correlation measure. Okay, so what you observe here, and, and the size of the circle, by the way, the size of the circle is the assets under management in each ETF. So what you observe from these snapshots, it's there are broadly speaking two clusters in the market. So a cluster with uh, low fees and low product differentiation, that's the, the blue circles of the broad based products. And then there's a cluster which becomes uh, bigger over time of red dots, which are the specialized ETFs that have high differentiation and high fees. So these uh, two clusters are consistent with two basically equilibria in the market in terms of uh, fees and product differentiation. What you also notice in, uh, uh, from, this, uh, 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 from this picture is that uh, there is more concentration uh, of assets in the uh, broad-based segment. So there are few ETS with very large assets under management. And that's probably the result of the fact that competition on price leads to a winner take all, takes all uh, equilibrium where the first comer you know, takes the, the whole market. Instead, uh, because uh, uh, differentiation here creates uh, uh, some sort of monopoly for, for each ETF. So each ETF can create the, their own, uh, uh, so can survive in the market uh, even with the smaller assets, also because they charge higher fees. Okay, another, uh, another way to, um, uh, to uh, examine segmentation in the market is to study the demand for these products and how the demand uh, response to price, and the price is the fees of this ETF. So the, the demand is measured by the flows in the standard way in the, in the uh, mutual fund industry. So these are percentage flows. And so we see how flows react to fees. Uh, in these regressions, we also include performance. We control for performance. And so uh, we, we focus in particular on, on the price, so on how uh, demand responds to price. You see that in general, there is a, a negative relation between uh, flows and fees. So there is uh, less demands for more expensive product, but this is not the case for specialized ETFs. Actually, the relationship goes to zero once you put these two coefficients together. It's no longer significantly different from zero. So this suggests that there are two equilibrium. One equilibrium in which uh, investors care about the price, and one equilibrium in which investors do not care about the price. Um, and this is especially true in a more recent uh, subsample when there are more specialized ETFs coming to the market. Another, uh, another way to look at a similar result is to look at uh, an interaction between price, or so the fees, and the extent of media attention for the, uh, for the companies in the ETF portfolio. So media attention makes a product salient. So make a product distinctive. So, uh, so that investors eventually 
uh, forget about uh, the cost of this product and, and give more attention to other product characteristics. You see that the products, the, the ETFs that are more salient, uh, for these products, there is uh, no longer a significant uh, relationship between uh, uh, price and demand. Uh, and finally, this is uh, the result that I was anticipating before. Uh, you see, these are non-parametric uh, uh, regressions in which we regress uh, flows uh, on, uh, on performance. So basically, we compute flow performance sensitivity. And you see that uh, uh, the uh, relationship is uh, broadly flat for broad-based products. And this should be the case uh, if you consider a, a, rational, a rational investor. So going back to the, to the Burke and Green explanation for the flow performance sensitivity, well, there's got to be a positive uh, flow performance sensitivity once uh, when rational investors are learning about management's manager skill. But given that in passive products, there's no manager skill, uh, these are just replicating an index, so you shouldn't find a positive flow performance sensitivity if investors are rational. That's what you find in the case of broad-based products. Instead, there is a significantly positive FPS for performance sensitivity for specialized products, consistent with return chasing in this, uh, in this segment of the market. So consistent with investors that form expectation in, in, uh, in an extrapolative way. Uh, Francesco, sorry yeah. to interrupt. There are a couple of questions. Great. Uh, the first one is like, should we think about product differentiation more broadly by also considering open-end and closed-end funds, which may be offering alternatives similar to specialized and broad-based ETFs? Yeah, um, of course. I mean, you, you, you can extend this analysis to other investment products. Uh, so our, our interest, as I explained at the beginning, is really to study the, the dynamics within uh, the industry of ETFs in which you have no management skill involved. So we want to compare to other passive products. So within the, an industry where you, know, you, you cannot have a information asymmetry. That's, what I, you know, that's why we think you know, really you can examine uh, uh, the strategies of financial innovation, financial innovators in its purest form. Okay. Okay. Uh, so another question is, uh, the yeah, the person wonders like whether what would be a good yardstick for measuring performance for specialized ETFs. These are not competing on price but quality. Uh, so the question would be, what these investors are prepared to pay for quality? Are they underperforming on that basis? Yeah, that's a that's a tough question, and of course, I mean, investors might have a. Uh, uh, no standard preferences to which, uh, you know, let, let's stick with ESG, even if, as I said, ESG are not necessarily thematic. Uh, so the investors might be happy to pay a few percentage points in performance uh, uh, because uh, of, uh, you know, they, they, can, they can really invest according to their own values. Uh, uh, but this is diff really different to the, uh, different to different, uh, difficult to measure. Uh, so, in, in the paper, we, we, we stop at the point where we show that there is underperformance relative to standard asset pricing models, and, and that's the claim we want to make. But of course, you, know, you, you can always argue that this underperformance is acceptable if it gives us access to some uh, you know, values, value-based investing. I think, yeah, some questions about this benchmark uh, for the returns, like which uh, like is coming to. Uh, another question basically is about like, uh, in the US uh, ETF, uh, many ETFs have uh, thinly traded markets, small size and ADV. So how do your results look like if you exclude them? Um, yeah, I mean, our results are fairly robust to excluding, uh, you know, smaller ETFs, ETFs that, uh, um, uh, you know, are trading a very, very uh, niche segments of the market. So I don't, you know, uh, I would argue that the, the results remain unchanged. Okay, thank you, Francesco. And the last question uh, as of now is, how do you reconcile your fund flow results with Clifford et al. 2014 to show that broad-based funds do experience return chasing behavior. Is there some time heterogeneity here? Um, well, you know, there's, uh, there's some of this behavior in the tails. 
Uh, so the, 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 the advantage of uh, really uh, estimating this in a, in a non-parametric way is, uh, you know, you can, you can see the whole distribution. And so my claim of lack of return chasing behavior was really based on the center of the distribution. But, you know, you, you still find some on, on this, uh, on the left tail. Okay, thank you, Francesco. You're welcome. Okay, so uh, in the next part of the paper, uh, we really look at, uh, we, we unpack specialized ETFs, and we, what we do, we, we study the, the reason of existence for these specialized ETFs. What, what purpose do they serve? And, uh, and that's where we, 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 we try to tease out the two interpretations. So the uh, market completion story and the uh, competition for attention uh, theory. Uh, so, and the, the two theories uh, uh, diverge in terms of the uh, predictions for specialized ETFs, as I said, because broad-based ETFs offer diversification at a low cost. So there is competition on price, but at the same time, there is uh, a progress towards market competition, uh, completion. So uh, the rationale for specialized ETFs instead is, is less obvious. So what are the predictions of the uh, market completion hypothesis for, for these products? Well, one possibility is that these products give access to uh, positive alpha strategies, which were not previously uh, accessible to investors. So they, they, you know, these investors now can you know, follow strategies that were, for example, previously accessible only uh, to hedge funds. Um, if this is not the case, so if there is no uh, positive alpha in these strategies, well, then you must always argue that uh, uh, specialized ETFs provide a hedge for some risk factor. So investors are willing to pay uh, a, a, a premium so to sacrifice performance to get some hedging. So you see, to, to test these stories, uh, it's important to look at the performance of the, the, these ETFs. So what I'm showing you here is uh, uh, the overall performance, the, the history of performance. And here we compute it in a very simple way. We just subtract uh, uh, from the return of a portfolio of all the ETFs, uh, the, the return on the market. And then we'll have more sophisticated asset pricing models as we go along. And as you, you see, uh, almost uh, um, uh, over almost the entire sample, uh, specialized ETFs tend to underperform. So there's only a few years between 2003 and 2008, I would say up to the financial crisis, when they, uh, their performance is uh, positive, but overall, uh, you know, over the entire simple, the, the abnormal uh, sample, the abnormal performance is very negative. Okay, so this was a, a, a rough uh, view to look at performance. Uh, so let's instead uh, compute, uh, construct portfolios and compute alphas for portfolios. So what we do is in every month of the sample, we construct a portfolio of all the ETFs that are available in the market. And then we track these portfolios over time. And so we compute uh, performance from different asset pricing models, going from simple excess returns to, uh, to a Q factor, uh, Q factor model. You see that uh, across uh, uh, models in general, they perform asset pricing model in general, the performance specialized ETFs is negative. And in particular is uh, negative and significant if you benchmark it to the performance of broad-based ETFs. So investors would have been better off in terms of performance, risk-adjusted performance, just by holding broad-based products. So it turns out that they do not give access to positive alpha strategies. So this uh, hypothesis doesn't seem to hold water. So the question then is whether they provide hedging for some risk factor. So how do we test for that? Well, one way in which we test for this hedging hypothesis is basically um, arguing that if the specialized factor is uh, hedging for some other risk factor, it has to be the case that uh, the stocks that have most negative correlation with the, with the portfolio of specialized ETFs, well, these stocks should earn a positive alpha because investors want to stay away uh, from them because they are more risky. And so that's what we do. So we construct five quintiles based on the beta of these uh, of, uh, of stocks on the specialized portfolio. And we look at the, at the alphas of these uh, portfolios, uh, the alpha relative to different asset pricing models. And we ask the question whether the, the alphas for the mostly negative correlated portfolio is uh, positive. Well, there doesn't seem to be 
evidence in this direction. So again, uh, the evidence doesn't seem to, to support this uh, 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 hedging view. So this uh, market completion hypothesis, which by the way, we test in another way also. So if investors uh, are uh, willing to accept negative performance because of a hedging premium that they want to pay, well, then investors shouldn't be disappointed as the negative performance materializes. Instead, what we find is, is that over time, as the thematic ETF come of age, they experience more and more negative flows. So basically, investors uh, become uh, uh, disaffectioned with these uh, thematic ETFs over time, and they dump them. So exposed, it seems that they were not expecting this negative performance, so they were not uh, uh, willing to pay this premium for hedging purposes. And so uh, the market completion hypothesis doesn't seem to hold water. So then we, we, we see whether there is evidence uh, for the other hypothesis, namely that specialized ETFs cater uh, to irrational investors. Uh, so try to, to attract in the attention of uh, irrational investors. Uh, so let me stop here to see whether there are questions. So one question is, shouldn't the hedging demand uh, on the portfolio of investors demanding specialized ETFs? Uh, sorry, uh, can you rephrase uh, it? Yes, because uh, can you please uh, unmute yourself? And... Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, I think I had a typo in my... Exactly, question. I had trouble yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, what I was saying is that the hedging need would depend on the portfolios held by those investors who are buying the specialized ETF. So I didn't quite understand the way you- Okay, yeah. yeah thanks, so thanks because thanks uh, because for the question, yeah. Yeah, so I think that's a little bit more complicated because uh, it just depends on who is actually buying this, what else they're holding in their portfolios. Uh, yeah, but uh, our point, I think it's, it's more simple than that. So uh, what, we, what we observe here is that there is a negative alpha to this uh, ETFs. So, you know, how do we interpret this negative alpha? This negative alpha can be some uh, unobserved risk factor. So it's got to be the case that, uh, you know, if we look at the most negatively correlated uh, portfolio with these guys, with, with these specialized ETFs, well, it has to load some on some risk factors uh, for, for, for risk to be an explanation of this uh, negative alpha. Uh, and with this exercise, we don't seem to find that. That's all we wanted to say. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a very active uh, set of co-authors. I really would like to thank like uh, Itzhak, uh, Wingwung and Rabi. So uh, we can basically move Francesco. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me, uh, you know, present the evidence uh, for, uh, you know, the, the analysis that tries to uh, shed light on the other conjecture. So the fact that uh, specialized ETF ETFs uh, uh, try to draw the attention of irrational investors. Okay, so what's the, the conjecture mechanism here? So um, the, the story is that some investors are attracted, attracted to recently well-performing and visible themes. For, think about vaccines, for example. So then EDF providers cater to the demand for these uh, salient themes. And then uh, specialized ETFs are launched uh, to cater to this demand. But when they are launched, they are already late in the valuation cycle because it takes time, first of all, to identify the theme and then to uh, do all the administrative process for the creation of the ETF. So the ETF comes late in the valuation cycle and soon after the launch of the ETF, the, uh, you, you measure this underperformance. And so uh, to formalize this, we the, the, the conjecture here makes three three predictions. Uh, the first is that specialized ETFs contain salient stocks, so stocks that have attracted attention uh, uh, in, in recent periods. Uh, they deliver negative performance, but soon after launch. And also, uh, finally, that they, they attract unsophisticated and sentiment-driven investors. Okay, so let's see what the evidence is for these three predictions. Uh, so here, what we do is basically we unpack the ETS, and we look at the stocks that they contain. In particular, we look at uh, stock characteristics 
in the two years before the launch of the ETF. Okay. Uh, and so what, what we find is that uh, there is evidence consistent with saliency of the stocks in specialized ETFs. So they uh, have probably attracted investor attentions because they outperformed and, and, and outperform also relative to uh, broad-based products in, in, a significant, in a significant way. Also, they attracted attention because they had more uh, media exposure. So here we count the news for the stocks that are in the portfolio. Uh, here we look at the sentiment for these news and the sentiment is significantly more positive for specialized ETFs. And finally, we look at the earnings surprises for the stocks. And again, they are significantly more positive. All of this is consistent with more salience of these stocks. We also find uh, that uh, the return distribution of uh, uh, the stocks uh, in specialized has a more positive skewness, significantly so. And this is consistent with catering to investors that have a preference for gambling. So they, they provide option light payoffs. And finally, what we observe is that uh, 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 the stocks in specialized ETFs rank high for measures of uh, 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 overvaluation. In particular, they have higher book to mar uh, market to book ratio and they have higher short interest. So to summarize the evidence from this table, the stocks in specialized ETFs have attracted more attention and they appear to be more overvalued. Another way to look at valuation is to, to see how uh, the timing of uh, uh, launches occurs. So here is an event study where time zero is the launch of the ETF. In red, you have a specialized, in blue, you have broad-based. And you see that uh, the specialized ETFs are launched after the market to book ratio of the underlying stocks has reached a peak. Already when the ETFs is launched, there is a, a decline in the market to book ratio, which subsequently you know, falls below that of broad-based products. And that's consistent with the underperformance that I showed you. And similar evidence uh, of reversal of sentiment can be uh, 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 observed by looking at the sentiment for the stocks in the portfolios, you see the sentiment is significantly higher for specialized before the launch, but then it reverts to the level of the other products after the launch. So there is high uh, and positive sentiment, which then reverts. Uh, then we look at the performance. This is the figure that I showed to you uh, during the introduction, you see. Uh, these are uh, um, uh, alphas from a four-factor model in the 60 months after launch. So this is right after the launch, so in the five years after the launch. And you see there is a significant underperformance. So these are the 6% the per year I was telling you about. And this underperformance, if we go back to the, to the portfolios, this underperformance is, uh, you know, uh, in the 60 months uh, after launch. So that's where you have the, the strongest alphas. Whereas if you go in the 60, uh, after 60 months, so uh, for ETFs that are more than five years of age, you, you no longer observe this uh, significant, underperform significant underperformance. So really the underperformance is concentrated after the launch, consistent with the deflation of this overvaluation that was uh, present right before the launch. Uh, then we do uh, portfolio splits. So this is double sorting basically. So we sort by broad-based and specialized. So these are DTFs sorted by broad-based and specialized, but also by the past returns of the stocks in the portfolio. And you see that the negative alpha here is a, especially there for the uh, ETFs that have stocks with the highest past returns again, consistent with the positive sentiment that then reverts. And similar, the, the largest negative alpha is for the ETS that have uh, stocks with the highest uh, media sentiment, and they are also the specialized ETS with the highest median sentiment. Um, and then in the final part of the paper, we look at uh, investor clientele. So here is where we use uh, 13F. And so there is uh, more institutional investors in broad-based ETFs 
And uh, conversely, there is more retail investors in specialized ETFs. And so this is, uh, you know, if you think that retail investors are uh, typically less sophisticated, uh, this is consistent with the view that specialized ETF cater to less sophisticated investors. And even stronger evidence in this direction comes from looking at uh, uh, Robinhood users. So this is uh, users of the Robinhood platform. We standardize by assets under management. And you see that uh, Robinhood users, which are known to be sentiment driven and follow investment frenzies, well, they are disproportionately uh, investing in specialized ETFs. Uh, there is, this is more evidence coming from the Robinhood platform. Uh, you see that uh, these users have a uh, um, great uh, uh, positive sentiment. So this is the number of users for the stocks in the uh, specialized, which peaks before launch, and then it reverts after the launch of ETF. Again, this is evidence suggesting that uh, the launch is late in this sentiment cycle. And then there is uh, how users of, ET, uh, of ETF, so this is for the underlying stocks, and this is for the ETFs themselves. So you see that there is a, a great uh, uh, enthusiasm of Robinhood users at the beginning, which then reverts. So these are months after launch. So time zero is the launch of the ETF. So this is all the evidence I had. So uh, let me conclude and then I can take more questions. So, um, you know, we started out uh, with uh, the question of what drives uh, financial innovation in DTF market. So uh, the paper provides evidence that is consistent with the model in which uh, providers uh, of uh, financial products compete for investor attentions, and they can compete in, in two ways. They compete uh, by emphasizing a low price. That's a, a price salient equilibrium corresponding to broad-based ETFs in which investors look for uh, you know, broad diversification at a low cost. But there is also a, a quality salient equilibrium, which corresponds to specialized ETFs, in which you have uh, sentiment-driven investors that chase uh, salient themes. So themes that, be, that, that were very popular in recent, in recent times. And so you see that the, the same platform, the ETF platform, can be used for diverging purposes. So can provide uh, uh, diversification at a low cost, which is a, uh, a, a, a welfare enhancing purpose. But at the same time, it can be used to cater to uh, irrational or investors with no standard preferences. Uh, preferences. And in that case, uh, at least there, is some, there are doubts whether this is uh, welfare enhancing. And let me uh, uh, just uh, zoom in on the quality computation mechanism. So uh, just let me remind you how it works. So there are themes that become salient. Then there is demand for the theme. This demand for the theme leads to overvaluation for the securities tracking that theme. At the same time, the providers of financial products cater to the demand uh, for that theme, but they do it with a lag. And therefore, soon after the launch of the product, there is underperformance uh, of these products that are tracking the theme, notably the, the specialized ETFs. That's all. So um, let me see whether there are questions. There are some questions, Francesco. So the first one is, uh, what leads to the reversal of the poor performance of specialized ETFs in the long run? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the story I was, uh, I was telling you. So basically, uh, what we are arguing is that there are these themes that attract a lot of demand. So this demand pushes prices up. Uh, and so some of this demand uh, is not warranted by valuation. So it's, uh, it's irrational demand. And then because these are overvalued securities, then there is a correction of this overvaluation over time. And so the ETFs that hold these securities eventually uh, underperform as the overvaluation is deflated. I see. Uh, the following question, basically, it's uh, answered, but like we can hear it from you too. I mean, if specialized ETFs are overvalued, how can it last for 60 months in the presence of short sellers? Yeah, um, it, the, the overvaluation comes from uh, the overvaluation of the underlying securities. Uh, you know, the, the value, eventually the, the value of the ETFs is derived from the value of the underlying securities. And so, you know, we, we know that overvaluation cycles last for long. So there is, uh, you know, 
abundant literature on overvaluation uh, on se on sentiment cycles that you know they can take several years to be corrected. You know, going back to the original noise traders paper. So I'm not surprised that overvaluation is is long lasting, and you know you can justify that with the presence of short selling constraints. Okay, okay. Another question is uh, among specialized ETFs. How do media sentiment, fees, institutional ownership, and other factors affect performance? Uh, for example, does a low style of media sentiment perform better uh, than those with the high sentiment? Uh, so, um, yeah, so these are the results I was uh, referring to. Uh, basically, we, we do some of that analysis. So we, do, we have a split by media sentiment. And indeed, as uh, uh, the question was uh, uh, alluding to, the, the ETFs with uh, lower media sentiment actually have uh, uh, less negative alpha. So it's where there is more media sentiment, more positive media sentiment, more positive. So these, uh, uh, these are uh, more positive media sentiment. Those are those that uh, uh, underperform more. Okay, thank you, Francesco. Another question is, how will the new SEC rule 2019 about launching ETFs without delay and exemptive relief affect the results? Uh, oh, that's a great result, question. Yeah, yeah so, will the result about delayed launch still hold or will it at least be muted? No, that's a great question. Uh, so it, it is, it, this rule uh, became uh, effective late in 2020. So uh, it is not uh, cover, covered in our sample, except for the, you know, for some of the results in the very last part of the sample. Uh, so this rule effectively by um, uh, uh, el eliminating some uh, restrictions to listing ETFs, so giving automatic exempted, exempted relief, uh, makes uh, the process of bringing ETFs uh, faster uh, to the market. So an ETF can, can reach the market in, in about two months, as opposed to the six to a year, six months to a year, which was previously the case. So um, my expectation is that you should see, uh, so let's go back to the figure of this figure, Rather than uh, you know underperformance starting right away after the launch, you could still see some upward trend and then the underperformance starting later on uh, in in this period. So that's what uh, you know my 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 conjecture would be because DTFs come you know can come to the market when the theme is still popular. For example, you know there there will be an ETF launched in March that is based on an index that tra tracks social media sentiment. So this, this ETF, you know, was, you know, uh, was, um, was launched also on the wake of recent events, you know, where social media sentiments was driving, you know, valuations. And so we should expect that, uh, you know, as long as this ETF comes uh, uh, soon enough to the market, it will capture some of this positive trend. Uh, thank you very much, Francesco. I mean, like, uh, it was a very active seminar, and so there were so many questions, and because the co-authors were very active, too, uh, I did not ask some of the questions, but, like, like some investors, I have limited attention to. Uh, if I uh, didn't ask some of the questions, I apologize in advance, but don't worry. I mean, like, we'll give uh, the co-authors uh, all this chat uh, and all the transcripts, so your questions will definitely be read in case I miss some of them. Uh, so thank you very much, Francesco, again, for this great presentation. And I would like to thank- you for the questions and for the opportunity to present. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the Isak Gwengwuk and Rabi Musavi too uh, for their active participation. Uh, so basically uh, we are looking forward to seeing all of you again, uh, same time next week. Uh, we'll have Huayi Zi Chen from Notre Dame and next week at the same time. So until next week, please stay safe and well. Take care.